Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Carragher. Uh, I am the founder of the Sound of Work Club. Really appreciate everyone taking time out of their day today to join us for this week's battle chat. Um, obviously, you know, we're living in some bizarre times, and really it's important for us all to get together as a community, as a paddling community, uh, to learn from one another and just really keep the stoke up. Uh, so I'm excited today to have Sheila and Duncan Goss join us uh, for this week's paddle chat. Um, before I jump in, a little bit about Seacoast Paddleboard Club for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Um, we are just shy of 100 members. Um, we were founded in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in 2015. Uh, our paddlers paddle mostly in New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont, and Massachusetts. And our club motto is to get out of the water, have fun, and give back. So in addition to hosting regular meetup paddles, uh, Seacrest Paddleboard Club also hosts regularly charity, charity paddles, beach cleanups, and other activities both on and off the water to really support our local communities. If you'd like to learn more about Seacrest Paddleboard Club, I would encourage you to check us out online at seacrestpaddleboardclub.com. Uh, before we get into today's presentation, I also want to take, give pause and say thank you. Um, we have a lot of friends, family, and club members that are literally on the front lines of COVID-19, uh, our nurses, uh, essential workers. So they, many of them can't be with us today, but they are in our thoughts. So we are thinking about them, and we just want to give a huge thank you to them. Also, I just want a couple of housekeeping tips here. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to uh, access this on demand after the presentation. Uh, for quality purposes, all participants have been muted. Uh, we have a pretty full room right now. Um, but if you have a question, I would encourage you to use the QA uh, feature to ask a question. And myself or our guests or co-host, Sheila or Duncan, will be happy to get you an answer. Um, with that in mind, I would ask if possible to ask, hold, refrain from asking questions to the end so that the presenters can get through the presentation and keep their stream of thought. Uh, with that being said, today's webinar, How to Paddle with Your Pup, is being presented by Duncan and Sheila Goss from Vermont Paddle Pups. Uh, very excited to have them. I met them, wow, a couple years ago at the Kittery Trading Post uh, Paddle Spark Show. Um, it was great to meet them. I was following them for a while on social media. Uh, Duncan and Sheila live in Stowe, Vermont, where they're active in the outdoor dog pursuits, such as canoeing, kayaking, uh, canoe camping, snowshoeing, and hiking. As advocates for responsible outdoor adventuring with dogs, they have given presentations to local libraries, animal shelters, uh, at New England Paddle Sports Show with Kid Kittery Trading Post, and love sharing a passion for having fun outdoors with their dogs. Uh, they and our two rescue mutts travel all over New England and the Adirondacks and Canada searching for new adventures to share with their dogs. So with that, I'm very excited to turn it over to uh, Sheila and Duncan. And I hope you can all see. Hey there, Sheila Duncan, you there? Yep, yes. we're there. He's getting the screen up. Okay, excellent. Joe? Oh, oh, hold on just a second, technical difficulty. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> problem is the go. button is coming up by the... Uh, <laughs> There, there we, we go. go. <laughs> Got it. All right. So can you see us? Absolutely. You look good. So I will hand it off to you. Thank Great. you, guys. Thank you very much. Hi. I just want to welcome everyone. And thanks to Chris and the Seacoast Paddleboard Club for inviting us. Um, we've met you folks down at the Paddle Sports Show at Kittery for a number of years. And we love following you on social media. Glad you do follow us. And again, we just want to send uh, best wishes to everyone that's out there. 
um, folks that are fighting the battle right now and folks that might be stuck at home because of the battle right now. Um, we, we're all hoping to be on the water soon and we're glad that you took a little bit of time in your Sunday afternoon to share with us. So we are the Vermont Paddle Pups, which is nothing more than a blog that we started a number of years ago when we got our second rescue mutt and decided that we'd document our attempts to teach him to be a canoe dog and then ultimately a kayak dog. Um, we don't use stand-up paddle boards, but what we found from folks that we know who do use paddle boards and who paddle board with their dogs, many of the principles are exactly the same. <clears throat> so if I don't address something that's specific to paddle boards, ask me about it, maybe we can figure it out. Can you make it so we can see ourselves? I'm not sure. Yes, you can. He's trying to get us so that we can see ourselves on the screen. Nope, take that away then. We can't do it. We didn't yep. do it. I just forget it. All right. Okay. So anyway, sorry about that. So, go ahead. So our dogs have been featured on various magazines, in Paddling Magazine, our book cover, and um, we get a lot of cover coverage, and that's because just as you folks are passionate about paddling and passionate about giving back to the community, we're passionate about sharing our love for responsible adventuring with dogs. So we love to share, we love to get interactive with other folks. We love to see pictures from other folks who are paddling with their dogs, other adventures. In fact, that's how we learn about a lot of places that we go is through social media. We have a blog, vermontpaddlepups.com. Um, we have an Instagram, a Facebook, and a Twitter account. And again, we love sharing our pictures. We try to educate and we try to learn from others as well. Um, we do quiet water paddling all over New England, Canada, and the Adirondacks. We've tried other places as well. Um, we've paddled 104 different bodies of water in seven states and five provinces. Um, I paddle over 130 days. I think I had 165 days last year. So we're a little bit obsessive about this, but we really do love it. So this is what we paddle. Um, we have a tandem boat, a big swift Kippewa. And then I have a solo canoe, which is what I use primarily. I'll take one dog out one day, and the next day I'll take the other dog. I cannot fit both dogs in the same boat. And then Duncan has a kayak, which is a Jackson Tripper 12, which is a very heavy, basically a plastic bathtub in the water. But it's an ideal kayak for kayaking with dogs. What we emphasize when we go out is safety because we're responsible for our dogs when we take them out on the water. The dogs don't tell us that they wanna go hiking or camping or canoeing or snowshoeing. We're the ones that think that they're gonna enjoy it. So we're responsible when we take them out. In terms of our paddling, um, no one, whether it's a dog or a person gets in our boats unless they're wearing a properly pitted, fitted PFD and the dogs wear life jackets. We're really careful about monitoring weather conditions. We carry emergency supplies in the boat. And we, we've both paddled ever since we were kids. And we've really only been avid dog paddlers for about 10 or 11 years. I, many years ago, I used to take a dog canoeing. But it's really only been the last 10 years that we've really gotten into this crazy passion of dog paddling. Um, but we were both confident paddlers before we took our dogs in the boat. And I think that that's something important that you don't have to be an expert. And we certainly don't claim to be experts. But whether you're a kayak or a canoeist or a stand-up paddleboarder, you should have some confidence and some skill yourself before you take your dog out with you. Because if you don't, things can turn bad really fast. If you're not sure what you're doing, the dog will detect that. And it can be quite a messy scene, as it were. Um, we also, we dress for the water temperature, not air temperature. Um, I do have a dry suit. So for example, I was out this morning on the water. I can get out once ice is out. Um, but if you're not, um, you know, if you're not aware of the cold water issues, I'm sure you folks that paddle on the ocean, you're, you're well aware of this. Um, the hazards that cold water can present. 
And I figure if I'm wearing a dry suit, if it's cold enough in the water that I'm wearing a dry suit, then the dogs probably need protection too. So what we did is we got neoprene hunting dog vests for the dogs to wear. So if it's, for example, this morning, early season and late season, the dogs will wear neoprene vests under their dog life jackets. One important thing about taking a dog in a canoe or a kayak is that you don't use leashes when the dogs are in the boats. Uh, we do use leashes, getting sometimes getting them in and out of the boat if we're at a busy access or it's kind of a tricky access where we really want to guide them. But once the dogs are in the boat, we remove the leashes. And that's because if we were to have an incident, if we were to capsize or even partially capsize or go over, a leash hanging from a dog is an entanglement hazard. Um, in canoes and kayaks, there are all sorts of things for leashes to get hung up on, whether it's gunnels, whether it's accessory straps, whether it's seats or thwarts. In a paddleboard, I imagine that's a little bit different, but if you are wearing a leash to your paddleboard, I suppose there could be an entanglement issue there where your leash could get entangled with your dog's leash. I don't know that much about it. I think that comes up to a judgment call. Um, but one thing also is never tie your dog to the boat. And that's, I, that seems pretty obvious, but every now and then I'll see a picture of someone taking their dog out in a canoe primarily, and they'll have that dog on a leash, and the leash is tied right to the thwart in the canoe. And that, that's obviously more of a danger even than just a, uh, a loose leash hanging. So selecting your gear and equipment. I know you've had a presentation on how to select a paddleboard. Um, if you're selecting a boat or a, a canoe or a kayak or a paddleboard or whatever you're using, if you're going to be taking um, the dog out with you more than just occasionally, I think you need to consider the dog's needs as well as your own. You want to make sure you get a boat that fits your needs, but also something that's suitable for taking a dog out. Um, aluminum canoes, the classic Roman, they're great boats. You can't beat them. But if you're taking a dog out, they can be hot in the summer, obviously, and they can also be very noisy. Every time your paddle bangs into the gunnels, and for dogs that are sensitive to noise, that can really be an issue. A good boat to start with is a, a boat like the Old Town Discovery. We had a 16 foot nine, which is really stable, a good family boat. You could put a dog and a kid in there with you as well, but it's very heavy and it's hard for car topping or portaging. So we got rid of that boat and we ended up getting to going to lighter boats. Um, I have a friend who has a, a 17 foot boat with lots of room, boat only weighs about 44 pounds, but he can put him, his husband and three dogs in the boat. And now they have a son that they've got to put in too. So that's gonna be interesting to see. Kayaks, if you're choosing a kayak, you have to decide, you want a tandem or solo, a sit on top or a cockpit, um, the sea kayak style, unless it's a really little dog or a dog can, will ride on the deck, it's really not suitable for most dog paddling. Um, there are different kinds of kayaks um, that are suitable for dogs. The upper right picture is an above shot of Duncan with Edgar in the Jackson Tripper 12. And you can see how Duncan is 6'5". You probably can't tell it because he's sitting down, but he's 6'5". And Edgar's a pretty good size lab, not mutt. You can see how much room there is in that boat. You really like it, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a beast to paddle, but it uh, is very stable and, uh, you know, perfect for me and the dog. So whether it's a paddleboard, a canoe, a kayak, or any other watercraft, a raft or an inflatable that you might be getting, get a boat that suits your needs, but also suits your dog's needs. Uh, paddling.com, which is a website that has a lot of reviews that people submit, their users submitted. They also have a classified section. In fact, I searched for six months before I found my solo boat and I found it through paddling.com classified. It's a great, an absolutely great boat. and It was a really good buy. So definitely check that site out for reviews, but also if you're looking. Be confident in that boat and also try to take your dog along with you. Um, if you're going to be paddling a boat, 
in a, for a trial, a demo, whether it's one of the paddle sports shows or Mountain Man Outfitters demo days or anything like that, and you think you're going to be taking your dog with you, bring your dog along. Bring a little mat for him. Bring your dog along and see how the dog does in the canoe or the boat or the kayak. Make sure that the dog has room to sit, stand, lie down, turn around, all those things that are going to make the dog comfortable in a boat. So the other thing that we do for safety is we always have our dogs, as I mentioned before, wear a life jacket. And people say, well, why, do, why does a lab need a life jacket? Or my dog's a water dog. He's not going to, he swims like a fish. He doesn't need a life jacket. Well, you might not need a life jacket, but most of the people I know that take their dogs out do have them wear life jackets. And it's not because they look awesomely cute in a doggy life jacket. Although they do. Although they do. <laughs> One thing is it provides thermal protection. And for, especially if a dog ends up swimming for any length of time in the water or early season, late season, depending on what part of the country you're in, that thermal protection can really help, if, especially if it's a life jacket that covers the dog's core area. It also provides a buoyancy aid. Our dogs are not good swimmers. They're both lab mutts, but neither one really likes to swim. They love the water, they'll wade and they'll splash and they'll look for frogs, but they don't like to swim. So they don't have a lot of experience swimming. So if they were to get in a situation where they had to swim for any length of time, it would be hard for them. So the extra buoyancy helps their safety. And then that goes along with the next one, which is reduces fatigue. Their effort to swim would be a lot easier when they're wearing a life jacket. Visibility, we like the bright colors for the life jackets. We tend to paddle quiet waters where <coughs> there aren't power boats, or if there are power boats, they're fishermen who may be going at a slower speed. But Edgar's a black dog. And if he were to go into the water, a lot of places, you wouldn't see him if he didn't have a life jacket on. And if there were a power boat or a jet ski or something else in the area, they wouldn't see him. So the life jackets provide visibility, which is another safety factor. The handle to help lift your dog. And I, one of the things I know about people who use paddle boards is they think that some people, they take their dog out on the paddle board and they think it would be easy for the dog to get back on the paddle board because it's low to the water as opposed to a canoe or a kayak. But apparently some dog, they'll slip. The dogs will slip trying to get up on the paddle board. So whether, whatever watercraft you're going out in, if you have to help your dog into the boat, it's a lot easier to have a nice handle on the top of the life jacket to pull them in. And it also can give the dog a secure feeling. You know, they're nice and they're snug and it's something that they're, uh, they're comfortable with. And I'll just show a few here. I wish I could see our screen, but just have to. So we have Outward Hound life jackets of various sizes. And what we like really the best is the Roughwear Float Coat is our favorite. And this is Griffin's brand new Roughwear Float Coat. And he got this because his other one is so gross and filthy and disgusting after over 500 days of use. And it doesn't really matter what life jacket you get for your dog, as long as it fits your dog, is comfortable, and that the dog is, can turn around, move, lie down, um, relieve himself, um, that it doesn't interfere with the dog's enjoyment in the boat. Um, and one thing, for example, is, I'll hold up this. Griffin, for a very brief period of time, used this Outward Hound life jacket, which is a fine life jacket. It's an entry level. It's not very expensive. Um, and it's good if you're taking your dog out, you know, not a whole lot of times, because it, it is not as expensive as some of the other life jackets. But what we found is it has a long body on it. And and the long body, what was happening was the back of the life jacket was getting caught in the thwart of the canoe. Griffin's a big boy and would go to turn around and he'd find that the back of the life jacket was caught in the thwart of the canoe. So we went to the rough wear, which is a shorter body, and he's fine. He is very relaxed and comfortable in the boat. And even little pocket dogs can wear can get life jackets that fit. This is Winslow. He's a miniature wire-haired dachshund, if I've got it right. 
and he paddles in Virginia and his owner found him the smallest life jacket he could. I think he's in a little bit bigger one now. <laughs> one thing about the life jackets is to try out the life jacket. And once or twice a year, we make our dogs swim. <laughs> they do as, not thank us for this. No, they do not thank us. And as I mentioned, they are not fond of swimming. But if we were to be in a situation where they had to swim for shore, it has happened to me one time with Griffin, he had to swim for shore, we want them to at least have the experience of swimming with their life jacket. And it's also a chance for us to make sure that the fit is good and that, um, that they're able to swim, that there's no imp impediment to their motion while they swim. So one of the other aspects about life jacks and PFDs is we promote for ourselves and for the canoeists, the canoeists or the kayaker always wear a PFD. No matter what the weather conditions, all year always wear a PFD. And that's what we do anyway, whether we had our, would have our dogs with us or not. And that's just based on statistics and data and it's safer to wear your life jacket all the time. And I know that stand up paddle boarders, I think a lot of you folks that use paddle boards use um, the waist PFD devices or inflatables. Um, I know a, a canoeist, for example, he, he hated wearing a PFD. And he finally realized that he really should wear a PFD. So he got one of the inflatables and he's much happier with that. And one of the things we say is, if you're not gonna wear it for yourself, wear it for your dog. Same way as if you're bringing a child out in a small, in a canoe or kayak, you probably should also be wearing a life jacket. Because if the child or if the dog had an incident or there was a situation where you had to assist that dog in the water and the dog could be panicking, if it's an unexpected capsizing or something like that, you're gonna be able to better help that dog if you yourself are wearing a PFD. You're not gonna have that extra struggle of trying to keep yourself afloat and also at the same time dealing with a panic dog. So that's, that's certainly our recommendation. Of course, rules and regulations, different places are variable, but that's sort of how we feel about it. So inside your canoe or kayak, one way that you're gonna make your dog more comfortable, whatever watercraft you use, is if the dog is not slipping. A dog that's slipping and sliding, and we all know that Every time we go out, it's not perfect mirror calm water. <laughs> that waves come up, wind comes up. You might be going on a, at a narrow, uh, a narrow river. You might have to be ducking under some branches. Different things make the move, boat move differently. And a dog that's slipping and sliding is going to be uncomfortable. And is not gonna be confident and might be nervous. And the last thing I want in my canoe with me is a nervous, shaking, quivering 75 pound lab mutt. <laughs> so we suggest that you put some sort of a surface so that the dog doesn't slide. And we've tried various things. Um, indoor outdoor carping works really well in the canoe. You can cut it to fit, it gets wet, you can clean it off, it dries pretty quickly. We found that things such as yoga mats and foam pads, what happens with them is when water gets underneath them, then the pad itself can sometimes slide on the water that might be in the base of the boat. So that's why the indoor outdoor carpeting really seems to work for us in the canoe. It has a little bit more of a grabability to it than some of the plasticky or rubbery kind of mats. The bottom center picture is Edgar in his Jackson kayak. And what we found in the kayak is a, it's, um, I think the company is Punt Surf that makes the 3M adhesive mats for paddle boards. And that has worked really well because we can cut, we cut that to fit inside the kayak. It doesn't move around because it has the adhesive. It provides obviously traction if it's designed for someone standing on a paddle board. And Edgar's very happy. He's very comfortable. He's very secure and he's not going to slip and slide around. So that's something that we did take from the stand-up paddleboard community and have put to good use. So this is what we, a rough idea of what we carry in our boat. And 
I know I see people on paddle boards have, may have a dry bag that they carry with them. Um, canoes and kayaks, we, we throw stuff in dry bags as well, may throw it in the boat. I have a canoe bag, which carries stuff that goes with me every trip. I just throw it in the back and it's got all my emergency stuff in it. Um, so we carry a first aid kit and that includes stuff for dogs because Unfortunately, at some of the access areas we use, we might find broken glass, bottle caps, things that people have left behind where dog could cut their paw. So we make sure we have uh, first aid for the dogs, things like bug stuff, tick, tick pullers, because unfortunately when we get out of the boat, we're walking through brush, whether it's on a portage or whether it's just hiking to a trail that we've accessed, Ticks are definitely something we have to be concerned about. We carry a compass, a waterproof light, dog treats, any guides, things like that. We also, we carry water for our dogs in the boat. Uh, a lot of the places we paddle, we don't really want the, most of the places we paddle, I take that back. If the dogs drink the water, it's fine. We're in Northern Vermont, we're usually paddling here, it's not an issue. But occasionally we'll paddle in an area where, for example, there might be a lot of beaver activity um, or, the, or there might be concerns about blue-green algae, which we avoid paddling places where there have been blue-green algae sightings, but you never know and if it's a little questionable. So we try to carry fresh water for the dogs. Certainly if you're paddling on the ocean, you'd need to carry fresh water for yourself as well. And we like to carry it with us because if our dogs were to try to drink off the side of the boat, there's a good chance we might all end up in, in the drink as it, as it were. So we're going to talk a little bit now about how you can help your dog adjust to becoming a happy and safe paddle pup, utilizing the things that we just talked about. So we have on the left picture is Griffin. I think that was his first day of dry land training. I think he was five months old. We had had him about a month. This was in June and we got him in late April. Um, and the right is Edgar when we got him and we were doing some dry land training with him. So whatever you're doing with your dog, and we're talking primarily about water sports here, but no matter what activity you're doing outdoors with your dog, obedience skills are critical in the boat, things like sit, stay, down, come. Those, it, the dog should be well versed in obedience. So you can do it in conjunction with training your dog to be a paddle pup or take a dog that has obedience training and just apply it to the boat setting. We use the command for hup in the boat and hup out of the boat because we decide when the dog gets in and out of the boat. We don't, since our dogs aren't real swimmers, we don't worry too often about them jumping in and out of the boat. Um, but that could be an issue if you have a dog that might be a swimmer and that might want to jump in and out of the boat. If you want to let your dog go in and out as you please, that's fine. That's your choice as long as you're willing to deal with the consequences. Certainly on a paddle board, um, quite a few people I know, the dog just jumps off and then they usually have to help the dog back with the handle on the life jacket. Uh, but that's sort of a personal choice. But for us, we decide where the dogs get in and out of the boat. Uh, and that can help too at, at uh, access points when you're getting in and out of a boat because um, the vast majority of capsizings happen within 10 feet of shore, which means when you're getting in or when you're getting out of the water. And I can speak for, <laughs> I can speak from experience. Yes, sometimes you can tip a little bit when you're getting in the boat to get started and you can get a little wet. So by having the dogs know that this is when you get in, this is when you get out, we can try to prevent that. Because it's usually my mistake. When you're doing dry land training, we started with the dogs on the grass. We put them in and out of the boat. We practice our obedience commands. And then when they were in the boat with a pad, with a mat, wearing their life jackets, we wiggle the boat, we rock the boat, we bang the sides of the boat so it makes noise, we bang the paddles and we wiggle the paddles around. So that it's just a little bit of exposure of them to what might be happening in the boat. And then 
when they're a little bit more used to that, you can take them in the water and you could do, try it in shallow water where you're standing next to your boat or your board, practice some of this obedience, wiggle and shake the board or shake the canoe or kayak right in shallow water. So that if the dog is nervous <clears throat> or if the dog is uh, unsettled, you can deal with it in a lot more controlled environment. You also can reward the dog for being a good boy or a good girl for sitting quietly or staying nicely in the boat. So this is just, this is our indication for you to take lots of pictures because when you're starting out, I know people that have started out and they just, they have, they really don't think they're ever gonna be able to get their dog kayaking or canoeing with them. I say take pictures because you're going to look back and you're going to be amazed at how far you've come. And this little, this little clip, people love this little clip because this was, I think this is one of Edgar's first times in the canoe and he was a little, he's a little leery about things that wiggle and move. So we weren't too sure about him getting in and out of the canoe. So he was learning to get in and out of the canoe on command. Come on, Edgar. Up. Come on. Up. Up. Come on. Good dog, Edgar. <laughs> and Griffin was sitting there like, yeah, come on, dog, get with it. It's easy. <laughs> so one of the other fun things to do is, is to meet up with other people that are taking their dogs paddling. Um, this little dog in the Pungo kayak is named Pungo. And his mom, Amy, runs a great blog called It's More Fun Outdoors. And they're based over in the Albany area in the Adirondacks. And Pungo was a very nervous, scared of its own shadow dog that had come from Puerto Rico after a hurricane, maybe, I think. And poor Amy, who's a very experienced backcountry canoeist, and paddler, and camper, was just getting frustrated with trying to get Pungo used to the boat. So we gave her some ideas. And, and then one day, we actually met up at a midway point over in the Adirondacks. And I brought Griffin, and she brought Pungo. And we went paddling together. And, you know, they say dogs will teach other dogs. And Pungo was so interested in watching Griffin and watching Griffin in the boat that Pungo forgot that he was nervous. And it worked out great. We had a great day. The picture on the left shows how we started with Edgar, who was very wiggly and can be a little bit um, excitable, shall we say. And we found that this works well with the dogs is that we started off in Edgar in the stern position. So he was with the stern paddler and that way the dog is nice and secure in the legs of the stern paddler. If the dog gets nervous, you can, you can comfort the dog, you can keep control of the dog. He's right in that compartment with you. And then as the dog basically proves that he's able to be calm, quiet, and well-behaved in the canoe, <clears throat> then he can graduate, as it were, to having his own compartment or a different compartment in the canoe. Certainly start with short trips. Um, you might only be 30 minutes, might only be 20, <clears throat> 20 minutes. And it's best probably to go early in the day without lots of activity and lots of boats and lots of other dogs and try to use a site with easy launch access. Since most capsizings happen within 10 feet of shore, you want a nice, easy, gradual beach access is great. Um, something where you can take your time with the dog, something where you can stand next to the boat with the dog and help them if they're nervous. Make sure your dog's had a chance to relieve himself first. Um, if it's a real high energy dog, if your dog's a real active or he's getting really excited about going, in the boat, take them for a walk. Take them for a little hike or a walk or play ball or have a run. Burn off some of that energy before you get in the boat. The other thing we found, especially on longer day paddles, is to pull, pull ashore. Find a nice spot, pull ashore, let the dog run a little bit. Um, run, jump over the canoe, whatever they want. Take a snack stop, take a pee break, whatever the dog needs. Kind of break it up so that they're not just sitting in the boat for a long period of time. You kind of work up gradually to that point. Dog paddling etiquette, this would be 
pretty much the same as any time you take your dog on any outdoor adventure. We're really fortunate that we're able to take our dog so many different places and behavior of dogs, but primarily behavior of dogs owners can sometimes put that at risk. I mean, we have had trail networks here that have been closed to dogs because of poor behavior. It's not the dogs, it's the owner. So we really <laughs> try to emphasize that the old saying, you know, one bad apple can ruin it for everyone else. And that can happen for dog paddling as well. First off, make sure dogs are allowed at your location. Make sure you're not taking them to a place that doesn't allow dogs. If it says no dogs on beach, don't bring your dog on a beach. Go off to the side to another place to access the water. Keep your dog under control, even if he's friendly. If it says dogs have to be leashed at the access area or dogs have to be leashed in the state park, keep your dog on a leash. Keep your dog under control. I do recall one time when we were pulling in with our two dogs in the canoe to take out at an area and this woman had her two dogs running loose. I mean, the dogs were practically jumping into our boat with our dogs. And that was a, rather annoying to put it mildly. So make sure you keep your dog under control. Clean up after your dog it goes without saying. Don't let your dog harass wildlife. Um, I'm a very amateur wildlife photographer and I go out often very early in the morning because I like to see wildlife and bird sightings and both dogs are very good, I call them my silent sentinels. They will alert me to wildlife and birds that I've never seen or I have ne that I don't see that moment. I can tell from their reaction that they're seeing something and they show me, but they are not allowed to bark. They can't bark at birds, they can't bark at other paddlers, they can't bark at other dogs. We just don't allow them to do that. And certainly if we're on shore, we don't allow them to chase wildlife. In following the leave no trace principles, again, that's, that's common sense for any outdoor activity with your dog. This is some of the wildlife that my dogs have helped alert me to. We have a lot of loons in our area. Um, we've seen bear while paddling, eagles, um, night herons, bitterns. Um, last year, I don't have it in this slide yet, last year I was paddling along and all of a sudden Edgar was alerting to shore and he was really alerting. So I said, oh my goodness, it's another deer. Because at this particular lake, we've frequently seen deer on the shoreline. And he was up and his head was arched. He was looking, never made a peep. I look up and there's a big cow moose comes walking right out from the brush, right along the shoreline, right next to us. He did the same thing last fall with a bear. I hadn't noticed, he noticed the bear long before I did. And we paddled parallel to that bear for about 300 yards but Edgar never made a peep. Networking and share with others. There are so many Facebook groups for whether it's dog paddling, uh, paddling with dogs, sup with your pup. There are so many out there. You could, I've, had to, <laughs> I've had to really limit it because I, I figure I can't join every group and even if I join them, I can't follow them all. So it's, if you have questions about pro or problems you're having, so many of these Facebook groups can be helpful. Some can be rather annoying, as we all know, those of us that are on Facebook, but for the most part, reaching out and networking with others. We've paddled with, what, four different people, four different folks that we've met on social media in Manitoba, a couple in the Adirondacks, you know, all over, just from uh, meeting them on social media. We're of like mind and spirit, and we go out together, we finally get a meetup. Friends we've never met, as it were. Friends you've never met. Um, blogs. <clears throat> uh, some of the blogs, the commercial blogs, Roughware, Pet Guide, Trailspace.com has gear reviews. I'm a reviewer for them. Uh, full disclosure here, but uh, if you're looking for gear, um, those are good places. Paddling.com, as I mentioned before, is a general paddling website. So this is just a few of our adventures. Griffin, are you making noise? Griffin just woke up from his nap. So this is just a few of our adventures, and I won't ask you to identify the locations, but is there most here? There's most. So this is our local um, Green River Reservoir. This is this is where I was this morning with Edgar. This wasn't taken this morning. This was taken obviously up on a fall day. 
that's Waterbury Reservoir. Orchid Pond, we've been there. This is in New Hampshire. Any of you folks from the New Hampshire area, um, Lake Tarleton, yeah, over in the, in the Western White Mountains. Anyone been here? This is the Sawbill Lake, that's in the Boundary Waters. Or, this is a great regional park up north of Ottawa. It's in Quebec, but it's actually north of Ottawa. I'm not, I do not speak French, but I'll give it a try. It's Parc Regional du Poisson Blanc. It used to be called Whitefish. And it's a regional park. It's a huge lake with islands for camping. And quite a few people, uh, we did see quite a few paddle boarders there as well. It's an absolutely spectacular spot. We've been a couple different times where we go for uh, canoe camping on islands. This is in Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario. Canis Bay Lake, I think that is. Yeah. And then three years ago, well, two and a half years ago, we did a September trip to Banff National Park. And I found the, my favorite lake that I've ever paddled is Two Jack Lake, in Banff National Park. And then of course, you can't go to Banff National Park and not paddle at Lake Louise. So we paddle at Lake Louise. <clears throat> Nova Scotia. In 2019, uh, Kejimokujik National Park in Nova Scotia, which everyone thinks of Nova Scotia, they think of the ocean, but there's a fantastic inland Canadian National Park, Kejimokujik, with some fascinating portages. And we did a loop with a number of different lakes, camped on an absolutely spectacular spot. So that's the end. Happy paddling to everybody. Keep safe. Go back to him. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lynn Duncan. The photos are absolutely amazing. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, we'll see what we can do. First question uh, comes actually from Kristen. I want to bring my dog paddling, pa uh, stand up paddling. Is it possible to paddle on an inflatable? I think it's, I know people that paddle their dogs in inflatable kayaks. So I would assume that an inflatable paddle board is a durable enough surface that you could do that. Probably want to trim yeah. their toenails. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. And I would agree. I mean, from what I know of inflatable paddle boards they are quite durable i mean you see a lot of those on uh river paddling where you're actually doing kind of traversing some serious terrain with some big rocks and they bounce off rocks so yeah i think Kristen, you could definitely i think the consensus here is absolutely i mean inflatables you can paddle with your dog for sure so good luck with that um and then just a question here from julie thank you for talking about you know, the training on land, are there any other land drills or exercises that you would uh, touch on that help them to get your dog ready for, you know, their first outing on the water? Hmm. I, I would say the, the most important, make sure that obedience is good, the sit and stay and down. Because when you're in, it depends on what watercraft you're in. Um, but for example, our dogs need to go down and stay down if we're in really windy conditions. We want them down low in the boat. So I would say any fun obedience games with sit, stay down, um, rewarding the dogs for staying. And it's funny, you know, putting the dog, whether it's in the canoe or on a paddle board on land and shaking it and wiggling it, it's kind of fun for the dogs because it's something different. It's doing the regular obedience but it's not just boring sit stay down you know it, it's kind of giving a different spin to it so i would just say you know work on the skills that you're going to use on the water but do them on on land and just reward the dog make it fun you know if your dog has a favorite toy or a favorite blanket you know you can use any of those things too awesome and here's one, actually one more uh, from Donna wants to know, could you de describe, how would you describe 
if you if the dog falls off of you, you capsize, what is the procedure to actually get the dog back into the boat or the paddleboard? <laughs> ah, you know what? I don't have an answer to that because every situation is different. The one time I capsized with Griffin, we were only about 150 feet from shore. And I just pointed him in the right direction. I told him to swim to shore. And then I just took the boat and I basically swam with the boat and brought it to shore. Um, with a canoe, of course, there are ways that you can empty it in the water. You can get in and you can paddle it when it's full of water, but the dog is not going to want to stay in it when it's full of water. The dog would have to be swimming. Um, in that case, um, as I mentioned, we don't put leashes on the dogs when they're in the canoe, but we have leashes available to us. If I were to be paddling my canoe full of water, I would have my dog leashed beside me so that he's swimming along beside me. And that would be either from the leash that you know, we used it at the access area and just threw it in the boat um, and, you know, take it out and use that. Or the other thing that, let me see if I find it here, that I hope you can see this, folks, because I can't see myself here, um, that we found works really well if you're taking your dog in the boat. It's called the Rough Wear Quick Draw Leash, and it's a collar. You clip it onto your dog's collar like it was a regular leash, and you basically have a short leash right? But you don't want to have a leash hanging. So while you're not using it as a leash, it has Velcro tabs. So when it goes around the dog's neck, it's secured just like a second collar over their first collar. So if we were to capsize, then I could just release this, hold, hold on to him, and I'd be paddling. It would be a little interesting, <laughs> but we'd be pad I'd be paddling with the full canoe. The, uh, on the paddle boards, you yeah, you know, I, I assume you can get yourself back on the board fairly readily. And once you've done that, the handle on the back of the dog's PFD allows you to haul them back on board. Right. Yeah. I, I think that it, it's always, especially in times when we've been really, really windy, in a really windy situation, I always try to think, okay, if we were to take on water, it's pretty good to put it mildly, take on water, what would I do with Griffin? And I want. I know that if I'm close to shore, I can just send him to shore if I'm close to shore. Um, but again, if I have to paddle my full boat um, or I have to get, you know, with the kayak, try to empty the kayak, do a kayak over the canoe, we probably want to keep the dog with us. And that's when having the leash handy would probably be something that would be useful. We're not on him while he's paddling, but having one handy so that if we had to keep him with us, while we were doing a boat over boat um, to get back in the water. Because getting, a dog can get out of a canoe really easy. Even a regular canoe, forget the, whether there's water in it or not, just in normal circumstances. A dog can jump out of a canoe in the water. But a dog that jumps out of the canoe in the water, to get that dog back in the canoe is really hard, even with a handle. Um, I don't think I could get Griffin back in the canoe if he went out of the canoe. I did have Edgar jump off one time and I did manage to pull him back in, but then Edgar is a little smaller than Griffin. Right. Just right. grabbed the handle and pulled him up over the side. So that's one of the reasons why, even if Griffin was a swimmer, I don't think I'd be wanting him jumping out of the canoe on his own. So that again, that I don't know if that answered the question or not, because every situation is a little different. Every um, boat is a little different and how you deal with um, if you were to capsize is a little different. Yeah, I think one of the things oh, is number one. Oh. Oh, there's Edgar. He agrees. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think that's it for the questions. Um, Sheila Duncan, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, for anyone that would like to know more, obviously, about um, Vermont Paddle Pups, I would encourage you to visit our website at vermontpaddlepups.com, right? Yeah. Uh, and is there anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so. I mean, thanks for let it, letting us share. And as I say, you know, we're, a lot of times we just, we don't have the answers, but we may know people who do and just 
say reach out on social media, follow us. And if you follow us, we will follow you. So that's the way we can see your cool pictures of your dog paddling too. And have Absolutely. fun. Have fun. That's the most important thing. Right, Griff? Completely agree. All right. Uh, there you go. And there is the, the, uh, the website there, vermontpaddlepups.com on the screen. So again, thank you guys. Really enjoyed having you as our guests uh, for this week's paddle chat. And be safe, stay healthy, and we will hopefully paddle in the not so distant future. I hope so. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone who watched us today. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.